Welcome to the second episode of Risk Ops Studio. I'm joined by Andy Renshaw. Andy, how you doing, Rich? Great to have you here. We've seen this massive drive in the UK now where scams now outweigh CNP fraud as the primary source of fraud for the banks. We also know that that's an explosion of risk happening around the world. We're seeing it in APAC. It's definitely arrived heavily on the shores of North America. Behind the scenes, how is this actually happening in the background? Because we see this in the technical side arising as a technical challenge in terms of sifting through data and identities and those things, but it goes way, way deeper than that. One of the really interesting things about scams is there is this temptation to think of it as a technical and a database problem. My view on scams, sometimes we tend to miss the basic, which is what is taking place on an emotional level here? What is taking place on a personal level? And actually there's a huge amount of preparation that goes into a scam as well. We tend to think about it at the moment where the fraud happens, but typically a fraudster will have looked at your account maybe five, 10 times. They'll know when you get paid on a monthly basis. They'll know whether you're eligible for a loan. When is your mortgage payment going out? And unfortunately, one of the things that digital has enabled is self-service and that's brilliant but what it's also enabled is fraudster access and that's ultimately where the fraud tends to start they will work out that optimum point when they can take the most money from you the second thing which is really quite nasty and really quite concerning is I know of several examples of customers being defrauded on a repeated basis because they know that they can target that customer they know they've built a relationship with them in some way and unfortunately the fraudsters are willing to go back knowing the bank will refund the money to the customer and actually target them again. It's almost like that old school situation you get, you know, 10, 15, 20 years ago where you'd have a suckers list that would be circulated amongst fraudsters. Back in those days, it would be mail addresses. Yeah. I had a friend who fell for that and he consistently got physical mail telling him he'd won lotteries, all of that kind of stuff because he got himself on one of these lists. But now you've got a digital version of that. And unfortunately, what you see is it's this really weird juxtaposition. The fraudster is trying to get the customer involved in the fraud. The bank's trying to get the customer involved in preventing the fraud. That's completely different to where we were before, which was almost, it was the bank versus the fraudster. It was the technology battle. To a certain extent, the customer wasn't involved at all. They're just off on their merry day, doing what they're doing. The customer's basically unaware. Now they're in the middle of the fight. Exactly. Right? The potential for confusion there is massive. Their perception of reality has become vulnerable. They feel like they've been targeted and they no longer trust everything that they probably trusted 24 hours before. And how a bank re-establishes that trust with a customer is vital. Fraud is a moment of truth. Fraud prevention is a moment of truth. All the stats show that if you get it right with a customer, they will stay with you far longer and they will engage with you far more. But if you get it wrong, you will lose that relationship. It, it is an absolute break in a relationship. I'd been with a bank and a credit card provider for a long time. They sent me a credit card to address that I no longer lived at with a pre-approved right. credit limit. That got used for, I don't know, 10, 15,000 pounds in the UK. Finally, when the debt collection agency came to me and said, we need to collect this debt, I rang the bank. So they went, well, we need you to pass security. <laughs> How can I pass security on a card that I never asked for and never set up? And it's just a great example, right, of what is happening to you on an emotional level at that time, yeah. what is happening to you on a personal level, how you are feeling. We tend to get a little bit technical and we sometimes lose the feeling side of it. So whilst technology can help prevent it, I think if you don't do it with that context in mind, then ultimately scams will continue to grow. And unfortunately, all the trends yeah. say they're continuing to grow. I've watched this for years. I used to have access to dark websites and those things in previous jobs I've worked at. I watched fraudsters score each other's capability with their card skimmed list that they were selling. People would give them stars out of 10. You know, that this guy's great, his cards work. Don't buy from this person. True story. My local branch, I'm not gonna say which bank, the person in that branch was being impersonated by a fraudster who was then calling people because he knew that they had been into that branch that day. He's been able to get access to data and unfortunately I think there was some internal collusion. But if you imagine you go in at 3 p.m., you talk to Dave in the yeah. branch and you have a great conversation with Dave and then you get home and you get a call from Dave and Dave says, oh, sorry, when you're in the branch, we didn't quite do it right. That transaction you thought you'd made, sorry, it didn't go through, but I just want to make sure that I can sort you out. You can see straight away the emotional bonds that are happening there. That kind of scam is not something that you've been warned about. It may feel not quite right but then when was the last time someone randomly called you from a bank branch anyway you've got nothing to compare it to but we're potentially talking about great service isn't it great that that person i spoke to is willing to make an effort to reach out because something didn't go right and they know i went in the branch between 3 and 4 p.m so yeah. that level of specificity just creates trust we tend to think about the transactional execution but actually we've also seen examples where fraudsters work out companies you've actually paid money to before so imagine you use a local builder they're actually 
scamming the builder in this instance, where what they'll do is they'll make another payment there, but then they'll use them to generate a refund. Oh, sorry, I've paid you twice. I didn't mean to pay you twice. Can you send the money back? And then suddenly the customer's got what they think is a legitimate refund in their account. So again, I can then ring you up. Imagine us having a conversation about that refund. The trust is implied. It's all about credibility. And it's this interesting battle between trying to destroy the credibility of the fraudster whilst maintaining your credibility as an organization where both of those powers are occurring at the same time. You've got a customer who is potentially emotionally under stress and therefore not in a position to make great decisions. The fraudster is putting that person in a fight or flight or deeply emotional state worried about losing their finances, their life savings, whatever it's going to be. Yeah. That stops people acting rationally. That's the MO is how to get someone unbalanced and into that state and that's you know as you say it's deeply nasty. Yeah and one of the best pieces of advice I, I always give around scam is actually getting people to pause can be hugely powerful. Almost letting their brain catch up with what's happening emotionally, to your point, letting the rational side kick in before the emotion gets there. So actually sometimes the pauses in processes are actually when the scam stops. And I think one of the things we actually don't see is actually when the scam fails, that customer doesn't call you to tell you why it failed. You tend to only see the ones where it succeeds, but what you don't know is they've actually had that conversation with 20, 30 people. We estimate that about 20% of scams the customer never actually contacted the bank to request a because refund. Because they're too embarrassed. Because they're embarrassed. They're willing to write off the money just so they can almost emotionally move forward and forget about what has been a very horrible experience for them. Yeah. The tendency is to think about, I need 25 data feeds, I need real time. That's all true. But in the end, don't be afraid to just step back as a fraud analyst, as a risk practitioner, and make sure you really understand the dynamic of what is going on from a people standpoint. Sometimes it's about asking a better question rather than about having better data.